Question? <coughs> there was a suggestion telling that uh, our faculty should be more transparent in marking paper and posting the result of each component of the exam. <coughs> so, uh, that's the thought. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate the Medical Society for undertaking this initiative of uh, having a forum uh, where the students can interact with the deanery. But having said that, uh, let me also say that uh, the deanery is very open to visits from students and questions. Right? Uh, the only thing is the deanery is situated in Saujana Putra, whereas the faculty is split in many areas. Some are in Saujana Putra, some are in Sumit Bulo Hospital, some are in Kuala Lumpur Hospital. So, and you, so not all of you stay in the hostels. So, for that reason, sometimes we find difficulty in access. But we are still accessible through the phone, through the email, and through various other forums. So, there is always an avenue for you to address these type of issues. So, uh, the first issue, before I answer that also, maybe I should also say that we handle about 960 to 970 students, right? Of which about a number are from foreign countries, right? And the foreign students have your own issues because you have got immigration issues, visa issues and other things. Uh, so that also must be recognized. And when you enter medical school, you come with certain expectations. Right? You come from an environment that is totally different. You come from a learning environment that you are not used to here. You come into a new environment and you suddenly have to adapt and adopt to the changes. So some do it better than others. Some take a longer time to do it. So if I look at examination results in the blocks in year one and year two, often the first block exam, there will be a disastrous result, right? Where the passing rate often sometimes hovers below 50%. That means only less than 50% may pass, or just above 50% may pass. And that also raises a question to many, uh, including the, uh, ma the university management, as to why medical students who are supposed to be top grade students are not able to pass the block exams. Are they going to graduate as doctors? And often our response would be, they will improve over the blocks as they learn the system of assessment and so on. Now, one major problem that students have is the language, right? And there is now a minimum uh, qualification for the English language capability that everyone has to meet and those who do not have that have been asked to sit and show evidence of that capability because that's a requirement now imposed by the Ministry of Higher Education. So if a university graduate does not fulfill that minimum requirement, that person can be asked to leave the program from the university. University is not entitled to hold on to them as a student. So, over time, I think uh, the English language understanding will become more apparent. Uh, now, in terms of assessment, the MASA system of the MBBS program at one time had about 40 plus or 45 types of assessment in your five years. Right? You may remember the two professional exams, the first professional and the second professional, which are major barrier exams, where you have got external examiners coming. 
<coughs> but not to forget that you will have the block exams. Uh, those days they used to have the mid-semester exams and the semester exams and so on and so forth. So there was a comment from the MQA that the undergraduate is facing too many assessments. So to reduce the number. So we have done that. And now the number is more manageable. But we are also trying to increase the number of formative assessments. Right? Not only the summative. Summative is where you are given a mark at the end of it. But the formative is where you take an assessment but you are guided through the answer and you use that assessment as a learning tool to get better at the subject. Right? It is less threatening. So you learn from it. Right? So that type of assessment we are trying to do more. Especially in the clinical scenarios, the clinical disciplines. Now, having said that, the whole assessment system has been evaluated by various external persons. Right? Uh, the external examiners for one, who come for the various examinations, the professional exams from various universities, whether they are from overseas, uh, they come from Singapore, they come from Thailand, they come from uh, Hong Kong and the region, right? Then we have got uh, an external advisor, right, who has gone through the MBBS curriculum and the system of teaching and learning and has given us comments and evaluated the exams. And we have had two accreditation exercises where we have had MQA panel members who come from external universities who have looked in great depth at the modules, what you have been taught, what lectures have been provided, and taken samples of your examination answers and scripts and looked at it. Now, all of them commended the examination system. All of them commended the examination system. And one word that was used, we have a very robust assessment system, right? What that means is the system was fair. It was not a system slanted to pass all graduates. Some will fail because they have not achieved the learning outcomes. But those who fail did not have a grouse that it was an unfair exam. And the external person who evaluated it thought that the marking system was fair. So, I start on that premise that the examination system is not set out to fail all of you. The examination system is set out, first of all, to pass all students who have achieved the learning outcomes. Right? So, in an assessment, there are many variables. The first and very important variable is the student. How much of effort you have put in, how much of uh, lessons you have understood, digested, and are able to answer at a higher level. Not just regurgitating it from memory, but understanding the principle, applying it to a problem-based scenario and giving a rational answer. So that is the first variable. The second variable is of course the teachers. Whether he has taught you in the way it is meant to be taught and if we find that the teacher's feedback is poor, we have taken action in many instances. And the third variable is the facility. Right? Uh, are we studying and learning in a conducive environment? Or are we surrounded by criminal elements where your security is a threat as soon as you leave the lecture theatre. Right? Or are you living in an area where it's not conducive to study after you leave? So I think you will agree with me that the facilities have improved, the teachers have improved, and the students have improved. Right? And that resulted in the last MBBS Batch, the fourth batch, yeah. fourth batch, having the highest pass rate on record of among the four batches, 
There were only two failures out of the 161. Right? So that is a reflection of that they have achieved the learning outcomes. So your question was, you know, is there a transparent marking system? Yes, there is a transparent marking system. Often, in some professional exams, we have a double marking system. That is, two examiners mark the same question in a blinded way, and both will give marks without knowing what the other person gave the mark, how much they were given. And of course, in some of the clinical exams, you don't have a double system because we have not enough lectures. The adjuncts are also involved. All right? So the question now is, are we, are the students able to access the mark? You are able to access the total mark, correct? Whether you pass or fail or the grade. But when you go to your mentor, you can ask, where is the area that I was weak in? All right? And they will be able to tell you in a general way, all right? We cannot give you the answer sheet and ask you to take it back home because that is not allowed under the university regulation. And neither can we tell you to come and sit in front of me and tell you all the marks of the other students and how I, I compare with the others. That is not permitted. I am also constrained by various academic rules in the university. And one of the rules is a result can only be announced after there has been endorsement from the Senate. The Senate doesn't meet immediately. Right? The Senate meets four or five times a year. So we have often in the MBBS program given your results on the proviso that it is subject to Senate approval. Right? So that you get to know the marks really. And number, uh, the next point I want to emphasize is feedback sessions are also encouraged to be organized. So one of the complaints from the lecturers is when we organize the feedback, the students don't turn up. This applies especially to year one and year two. All right. So now we decided the feedback session for the previous block should be the first session of the next block when you join the next block. On the first day of the next block will be the feedback session of your last block exam before the new block starts, because everybody will be present. Alright? So we hope that that improves the feedback, because feedback is important. Only then you will know where your weaknesses are. Alright? So, in, I think in short, the answer to your question will be, we try to be as transparent as the rules permit. And we can do more for individual persons who come up to us, on a one-to-one -one basis, rather than apply a general rule. I think, I think uh, Dato has covered most of the areas. And I think the other thing is, I think in any university, you won't know, uh, a, a full breakdown of the marks will never be put up. You will only be, only a grade, or sometimes just whether you have passed or failed the exam. That's all is actually accomplished. Number three is, uh, I think uh, Dato also alluded to that, we cannot, the university regulation is, results cannot be displayed on a notice board. That is why we are moving towards displaying the results on the LMS, okay? If you want feedback, you can meet your mentors or your coordinators for feedback. For phase two, again, I think uh, we have tried to have had, we have tried to have feedback, but <coughs> attendance is very poor. So you need to, if you want the feedback, then you need to tell your coordinators. But having said that, when the feedback is being done, you need to be there. If only half the class turns up, then it is also very, very demotivating for the teachers because they feel that, you know, nobody is around when we want to give feedback. Thank you. So moving on, uh, the second question that came up. It is regarding the... Uh, hassle of traveling between HKL, HSB and SBC. So with regards to certain uh, sessions that happen here, any distinguished lecture series or uh, sessions, and also sometimes uh, any other social or formal event that happens in SBC, students feel inconvenient traveling from HKL, HSB or JUC to SBC. They said probably if transport is provided, there would be uh, 
some sort of convenience for them to travel. Otherwise, it is since it is on their own, they feel there's some burden on them. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm sure it plays on a lot of people's minds. Uh, and I will try to give you the answer as completely as I can with the knowledge that I have. Uh, you must understand that I hold the position of the Dean of the Medical Faculty, but I am not in the top management. Huh? Uh, I do not have access to financial records and financial statements. Uh, what that means is I do not know the income of the university, expenditure of the university, profit and loss margin and so on. And I am given certain directives by the management to implement. Now, you know that we started in, uh, first in Pusat Bandar Damansara, the Faculty of Medicine, and then the Jalan University campus, where we were all stationed together, year one to year five, and you had the hostels there, and you travel to HKL and Sungai Bolo Hospital using transport that picked up the lecturers and picked up the students. All right. Over time, because Pusat Bandar Damansara had to be demolished because that was a rented premise and there was redevelopment of that area, the university had to look for an area where they had to build a purpose-built university and that was Saujana Putra. So you can also understand why they chose Saljana Putra, knowing the price of land in Kuala Lumpur City. Right? Because this was in Janjarung district, in Selangor State, at a lower premium. So a large piece of land has been bought, and a purpose-built university campus has been built, where all the seven faculties can be housed, and some students are also housed. Now, while that happened, the year one and year two moved right to the Saujana Putra campus and we did that exactly about I think a year ago, right, in June last year. Whereas the clinical disciplines remained in JUC. And that is not going to be permanent because the Jalan University campus belongs to the university. But if you go now, it is mainly the college and some other activities that go. But in comparison to the vibrant atmosphere that was there before, it looks very dull now, isn't it? And of course, there will not be much redevelopment of that area until the management can decide what is to be done there. At one time, the plan was to build clinics and a daycare centre in Jalan University. But uh, there needs to be licensing approval for that. And I think that has not come yet. Now I am told that there is going to be a restaurant built in the B block. All right? For dining purposes for the PJ community. All right? So, or an aged care centre. Right? For the PJ community. So, I mean, what that means is the development of Jalan University campus is rather fluid. It is something where you need to convert into income. You cannot just leave a building standing there with the electricity and water running and paying double there and here. Right? So now you understand what that issue is. I cannot tell you for sure whether you will remain there or whether all the clinical students will also have to come here for all your classes, that you will not have lecture theatres, auditorium there, unless it can be income generating, right? But we know for sure we are here, right? And there will be a hospital here in one or, you know, in probably at the end of this year or next year, there will be a groundbreaking and the land between the school, the international school and the Saujana Putra campus, there will be a hospital being built. And when a hospital is built, you will attract more lecturers who want to practice in the hospital. 
you will attract students who are in the clinical years who will need to come and see patients and attend to patients here, see procedures. So there will be more activity around here. Right? And the Jalan University campus may become a daycare centre, for example. I, but I'm not sure about that. Right? So when you say, uh, what can we do to, you know, for the transport? The university has decided that no more transport will be provided free of charge. Because transport costs accounted for about half a million dollars in a year, the rentals. And they said, we simply cannot afford it anymore. All right? So the decision was made by management. The transport will not be provided. And the lecturers who are now based in Jalan University by August or September will be relocated to the Grand Seasons campus. Right? They won't be in Jalan University anymore. Right? Grand Seasons and Sunay Bulu. So there, there will be no transport going even from Jalan University to uh, the hospitals. So where then are your classes going to be? And I think in the long term, the students must get used to the idea that it is going to be here. And in any place in the world where education is provided, you go to where the education is provided. You will seek it. By hook or by crook, you will go there and you know, partake in it. Right? Uh, that happens anywhere in the world. The only issue is you have got used to a system that had certain benefits. Now slowly you find the benefits are being taken out. So you find difficulty in accepting it. But I think to be realistic, you have to accept it and plan for it. Right? We are also trying on the part of the faculty to ease that burden. Wherever we can advocate, we have advocated certain uh, benefits for you. For example, one benefit is for the professional exam, buses will be provided for you from Jalan University to Saujana Putra at the start of the day and at the end of the day. So that benefit is there for this year. I do not know whether it will be there for next year. Okay? So that is the system that we are dealing with. Huh? So it is difficult for me to give you a definite answer. But I think if you look at the picture that I have painted, you will realize that you have to change the way we think. And whatever we do, whatever the faculty does, we are doing it with your best intention in mind whatever activities that are held here. We have a very good simulation ward here. We cannot create another simulation ward in Grand Seasons or Sunay Pulo. There's duplication of events. Mm -hmm. And it will never be as spacious as the one you have. It's all right, Doctor. Right? So it has to be here. So you have to come. Right, it's all right. I mean, right? it's okay, it's okay. The it other thing is uh, it should be fine, right? competency. Yeah. As you are a clinical student, as you go into the clinical areas, you have to become competent. You have to be able to handle patients. And how are you going to do that? Like a pilot who is told to fly a plane, you cannot fly a plane from day one. You have to practice on the simulation setting first. And that is what we want to do with the medical student. Right? And then see how it goes. Okay? All right, so that technically seems to be a very temporary issue, I guess. Moving on, uh, this is one uh, complaint that came in regarding the vegetarian, pure vegetarian food in Masa canteen, the happy cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, the food that is provided by any establishment is a business proposition. If there is a demand for pure vegetarian diet, you know, if there is enough demand, then that uh, establishment will provide that diet. But if there is not enough demand for that pure vegetarian diet, 
then uh, probably you won't get it. Because when you mean pure vegetarian, I don't know whether you mean vegan. If you mean vegan, that means you're talking about food that has got no milk, no dairy products and things like that. It may be very difficult for people to give you that kind of diet. So the habitat uh, doesn't have that, okay? But having said that, I think quite a number of us in the deanery are vegetarian. You have vegetarian food that is okay in the in the shops, okay? But pure vegetarian may be a problem. I don't think there is an easy solution to that, uh, to getting pure vegetarian diet. Unless you have a, a huge number of people who are pure vegetarians. I don't see any other way of solving that. Uh, as as uh, Ganesh mentioned, uh, we are. I am also vegetarian, uh, but I am not uh, very strict vegetarian in the sense that I have no qualms for uh, taking vegetarian food from a place that is also serving non-vegetarian food. <coughs> I just pick the vegetarian food and uh, put it on my plate. Uh, even though the plate may have been used by a non-vegetarian before, right? But some of you would be very strict about it. Now, I think the only, as, as mentioned, it's an economic proposition, right? Uh, see, when I went to the UK, I had no problems getting vegetarian food, right? In the hospital canteen, it was easily provided. But it was with a mixed environment. But there were options. Because there are many vegetarians in the UK as well. Uh, yesterday when I went for dinner with my wife, the restaurant that I went to, we were the only two customers. It's a vegetarian restaurant. I don't know how long more it will last. <laughs> <laughs> because we were the only two customers, but it's a nice vegetarian restaurant. Obviously the demand is not as great. Okay? So, one of the medical society initiatives will be to source food suppliers or food providers who can provide these various options, whether by delivery or whether by putting up a stall here, because you do a market survey and say how many people actually require that type of food and provide it. Or doing research and finding out for these persons where can they can go for that type of food. That is the only solution I can see, all right? The, but the big categories are provided for. Halal food is provided, vegetarian food is provided, non-vegetarian food is provided, all right? And, and there is clear labeling of you know, whether it's beef or pork or whatever, you know? So all that is clearly here. So I think we should advocate for it. But the management is aware that many people want vegetarian food, all right? But it may be restricted in choice. Right? All right. Thank you, Dato. Um, so moving on, this is an things one Prof. Gaines can answer. Can the faculty convey regarding uh, partnering with other medical schools in the near future, or is there any plans for partnering with other medical schools over in and around Malaysia and around the world as well? Again, I think, you know, uh, I think <clears throat> I have to go back and uh, allude again or refer again to what Dato told you in the beginning. <laughs> we are not the top management of this uh, university. We manage the faculty, okay? And um, um, I think the deanery has uh, always advocated that uh, the medical faculty get involved in activities with other faculties in uh, and around Malaysia. And we have always provided you with the support if you want to do that. Um, so we have done, uh, we have had activities where we have uh, participated in the recent JAMEX in uh, IMEC. Okay. We also have uh, had activity with uh, the University of Hong Kong last year. So we do do that. Now, I think partnering with another university, um, there are a lot of issues there with regards to um, the type of degree and the status of the university under MQA. 
So we we do not. I don't think there is any such long term plan as far as I know. Um, benchmarking is something that I think Datto is also very passionate about, and uh, we are trying to benchmark with some of the institutions around uh, our in this region. But again, I think you have to understand that that is not something that can happen overnight. You know, it, we need to do it step by step, and some steps are being taken. But it may take some time before it reaches fruition, you know. But if uh, you have avenues, uh, we are willing to uh, help facilitate those processes as far as we can. Okay. For example, if you want to do overseas selectives, I think Prof. Kauri is now uh, working with the university to speak to some hospital groups that may take on our students to do electives. So that may ease the, the process of for you all to, um, when you apply for electives, you may be able to go to the part to the group hospitals around the country or in the region. Yeah. Twinning is out of the question, right? Uh, because it is not in favor with the Malaysian Medical Council. Okay? There was, in the history of Massa University, there was an earlier effort to twin with the Gulf medical schools, right? Uh, one university in the Gulf region, but it didn't work out because there was objection from the council. Our partner in uh, UK, the Anglia Ruskin University, has just started a medical school, right? Anglia Ruskin uh, awards a dual degree for Bachelor of Biomedical Science, which is under the Faculty of Medicine. But uh, there is no uh, thinking about starting a dual degree, right? Uh, because it's going to be costly for you, right? Because there will be some part where you have to go overseas, right? But as I said, the way to go forward is to benchmark yourself with a foreign university. How can you do that? By doing an elective or even doing the whole year if you want to, with special permission, right? in another university and coming back and getting that recognized. I'm sure there are ways to do it, but I would like to urge as many medical students as possible in the fourth year, when you're doing an elective posting, don't ask for Hospital Kuala Lumpur and Hospital Skribulo again. Some of them come and do that. No, we don't want you to be there. We want you to go out. And if possible, go outside Malaysia. Right to another hospital outside Malaysia. It need not be any specific country. It can be some of the cheaper countries, like you can go to Myanmar, you can go to India, you can go to Thailand, and so on, or Vietnam, and do your elective there. All right? Or you want to go to UK, Australia, US, that's fine. But plan for it. Budget for it. And go with one or two others to those countries and let those universities see who you are, what a MASA graduate is capable of doing. Then the word will spread around the world about MASA University. If you remain confined to Malaysia, then nobody much will talk about you. So that's how you're going to get spoken about. I used to do some consultancy work in North Korea. Right? I was one of the few people at at one time, who, who probably was sent into North Korea. And uh, it was a very good experience for me in seeing how uh, that medical system worked. Because on the one end, you had a showcase medical hospital in Pyongyang, uh, which was state of the art, uh, with marble floors and so on. And then in other hospitals where in the OT, they don't have sutures and they will use your shirt material to take thread out and use that as sutures. Okay? So they were that disparate in their healthcare. But you will not know about it and you will not educate them how to improve if you don't travel out and open your horizons. So I hope that all of you will try as far as possible to go out. Right? And, and work in other countries 
do attachments and educate yourself, right? Because many of you are foreign graduates. You can go back to your countries and do your elective if you want to, right? Or to other neighboring countries within them, right? So let's do that. Uh, thank you, Dato. Moving on. So this is uh, regards to the library at the SPC campus where they don't allow the students to bring in their bag and water bottles, which students say <laughs> it is a being a cumbersome issue on them. So how do we address this? With the... Okay, thank you very much for that question. But basically when we look at it, it's basically rules and regulations of that hospital. So, I mean, if they're not allowing us to actually bring in our bags or water bottles, I think we should just comply with that. Um, well, it's not only in Sungai Bulo, where I come from, um, back in the north, they also didn't allow medical students to come in. Uh, I had aims there. So we had they had to leave their bags outside, water bottles, and it's basically the same. Uh. Library. Yeah, I'm getting for the library. Here. I, I, SPC, yeah. Yeah, fine. I mean, I, I mean, it, basically, they want to make sure that it's kept clean all the time, right? So, I mean, there are lockers provided. Yeah, there are lockers provided. So you can always keep your bags and uh, water bottles there. But I think uh, if there's no water, water, then I think. But most libraries won't allow you to take a water bottle in. I don't, they think, don't. That out. I don't think that happens. Even in UM, we cannot do it. Yeah, you can't take water bottles in the okay. Just because they use it, did they expect us to do the same? Exactly. <laughs> I don't take water bottles into the plane or so. <laughs> <laughs> there are restrictions, so you follow. Right? There, there will be a reason why that is. Because I think. One is cleanliness, right? Cleanliness, etiquette, and wherever that is, quietness, not disturbing the next person. So sometimes when you put bag, so the first thing you do is put the bag on your neighboring chair, and that will reduce the amount of seats that are available, unless somebody comes down to this thing down. So I think these are the reasons. Okay, moving on. Uh there's another suggestion coming in telling that uh, it would be nice if the end posting results for year 3, 4 and 5 are posted, uh, posted through the LMS. They say students need their privacy. Well, I wish it was so. <laughs> that is my instruction as well. Alright, but I think obviously some departments find it difficult to post it on the LMS. Because you need to actually put it without mistakes into the LMS system. But that's our instruction. And we are trying to train uh, somebody from every department to uh, you know, do it on the LMS without hassle. So hopefully by next year, everybody's result is on the LMS. We will definitely tell the HR department this is a feedback that is obtained from this meeting as well. Thank you. The next suggestion or the complaint is on the faculty's counselling services. Well, the university has a counsellor, all right? Uh, and at the moment, I think the counsellor is based on the sixth floor, all right? Uh, but I agree, maybe there should be a better uh, access to the counselling service, better information about the counselling service, which is provided, if not on a 24-hour basis, at least during office hours, without too much hassle. So I'll take note of it and bring it up to the higher authorities, uh, but at the same time, I think the deanery is open to you if you feel you need to access us for any advice at any time, 24 hours, all right? Uh, you, I think all of students have my number, correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah? If you don't have, you just find out from those who have. All right? So that number is available to you. So. And I think many of us number is also available to you. So you can always message us that you need some help and you need to see us. And we try and provide an avenue for you to see us 
as early as we can. Okay. So moving on, the uh, very big issue is regarding the uh, adjuncts in the hospitals and the uh, attendance or the payment is there, there as well. And with regards to the leaving early or whatever, so just for massage transport right, after class hours. Now, we depend for our teaching on adjunct staff because we don't have our own hospital. All right, to get access to the hospital, you must provide an avenue for, uh, for them to teach you as well. Now, in return for adjunct services, they are provided an honorarium. Now, to, for those of you who don't understand how this works, not everybody can be appointed an adjunct lecturer or an adjunct professor. There is a mechanism in which, first of all, the head of department of the local hospital, whether Kuala Lumpur or Sumai Bulu, must recommend to the head of department of the academic department that this is a suitable adjunct lecturer. So he will propose a few names. Now, the head of department will then request a CV from all of them and evaluate the CV. A specialist in a hospital must be have a recognized postgraduate degree and must be registered with the NSR. Now, the National Specialist Register. Now that mechanism is placed. Before, we just look at the recognition of the degree and whether you have two years of experience post postgraduate qualification. Yeah? So if you have just passed your MRCP or your Masters of Medicine, you cannot be an adjunct lecturer. All right? So after that vetting has been done, the proposal is put up to the Senate of the University the highest decision-making body of the university. So the Senate has to approve first. So sometimes some have been turned down because they say, that, okay, we know about this person, he's not a good teacher, or this is very inexperienced person, uh, why do you need this person, and so on. So once approved, only then can the head of department utilize the person for teaching. And the teaching has to be in a rostered way. It cannot be just ad hoc. Today I want to teach. Can you give me eight students to teach? And then pay me the money. No, it doesn't work that way. It has to be rostered. And when rostered, there is a claim form that the adjunct has to fill up. Right? He has to fill up a claim form, put the date and time he has conducted the class, and the student leader has to also get the class attendance list, and that has to be attached to this claim form. And then it is provided to the, uh, the faculty office, whether in Sumay Bulo or Kuala Lumpur. And for the month, it is compiled together. And sometimes they fail to sign the form. Sometimes there is no stamp. Sometimes the name is not clear. Then query has to go back to the person concerned, find the person concerned, correct it, and come back. So at the end of the month, the claim form comes. It has to be submitted to the dean's office before the uh, 7th or 8th of every month. And that reminds me, today is the 4th. <laughs> right? uh, so far, I have not seen any claim form yet. And suddenly, on the 8th, before the election, suddenly one big pile <laughs> land on my table. And I have to sign everything. The administrative process has to be completed before the 10th and set up. And then the payment will come out at the end of that month, the following month. And now, instead of providing a check, which those days they provide a check, they'll come back to the faculty office. Faculty has to decide this belongs to KL or Sukhai Bulo, and then send it there. And then they will have to go out and look for the person and give the check. So more delay. Now it is all online payment. Right? So once the claim is approved, the finance will transfer online to that person concerned. So there is actually not many delays now. We have got very little, to, very little complaints compared to before, right? I can tell you before what happened. There was a stack of checks that were in the faculty office when I came to take office. 
right? Because it was not given out. And it is expired checks. And we couldn't recognize the name. So those people have done their work, but no payment has been made. There are many things that are part of the system. So everybody has to cooperate to ensure prompt payment. But let me assure you, we do not want to deprive payment to anybody. We want them to be paid on time. So we are putting up new and new proposals. So we even advocated maybe we can give a fixed rate to everyone instead of uh, doing this claim business. But then again, we must find management favor first. Okay? Okay, uh, the next uh, suggestions regarding uh, students asking more public holidays. How I wish, How I wish. I also had more public holidays. True, true. <laughs> well, Malaysia is one of the highest number of public holidays. Right? And now, uh, you know, uh, maternity leave is now uh, 90 days. No, I'm uh, talking of various steps of leave. Uh, medical leave is about 14 days. Hospitalization is about 45 days, all right? Uh, public holidays, I think they are about 17 or 18 in a year. And of course, many people want to have religious holidays as well, because you have a particular religious function you want to attend. Now, I think the government, for the government servant, has provided seven days, right? Not, not for us, not, not for the private sector. But you have your annual leave that you but for the students who want to partake in some function or the other, you can. But you must ask and permission and inform before you go. The problem is you will go and remain quiet about it and be marked absent. And then when you come back, no, I went to attend a religious ceremony. Why don't you tell about it earlier? You know that you are going. Ask permission, we will allow you. Right? We can put that as a valid reason. That is what you will be doing when you start working as well. There may be a day when you cannot come to work for some reason. And then, you cannot just turn, not turn up for work. You must tell your head of department in the hospital that you are not coming to work. And then get uh, a special, uh, you know, permission first before you, uh, you know, be absent from work and then apply the leave when you go, right? I know all the shenanigans with leave that go on because I was head of department for many years. They will phone you and tell you, I'm today on leave boss, I cannot come. Is that okay? But the leave form will never come to you, right? They hope that you have forgotten about it and they will have one extra day of leave to take at the end of the year. But I have an elephant's memory, like I keep a record. <laughs> so I'll ask them, and then I'll politely ask them, where's your leave form? And then they know I remember. Same thing with the e-leave system here now, in Masa. Many people sometimes don't come to work and don't put up on the e-leave system as well. Right? But now, because of the electronic clock in system, we can detect if they don't come to work. They have to give a reason. Alright, so... Public holidays, I think, to be a productive country, you cannot have more public holidays, right? I think we already have too much. Many countries are blessed with us. But in any time that you want to be away because of special reasons, ask permission. Thank you. I think that is it. Thank you, Rato. So those who want leave, I think you have a green signal here. Use it up wisely. Um, one final this thing is regarding uh, the faculty's role in facilitating finance issues with regards to any other finance issue that already come up before this. But as far as the faculty is concerned, those uh, in J JUC, if you had attended the meeting yesterday there, you must know that the issue is being resolved. And for those in SPC, the meeting is on Monday. So those who really have financial issues are concerned with the finance department here, I hope you all have to attend it to know what's been happening. But as far as the faculty is concerned, the deanery will answer to this. Uh, well, again, uh, we are your advocates, right? Uh, whatever issue that 
you provide or whatever scolding your parents give to me, I still diplomatically tell the higher management that there is an issue. Uh, but one thing that you have to realize now, and the management I think is trying to inform you, your fees have to be paid at the beginning of the semester. Beginning of the semester, not at the end. Previously, I think all of you used to pay it at the end, just before the exams, especially the professional exams, clear the fees and then get permission to see. That, they don't want that anymore. And I think all universities also follow that system. It's like you renting a house. When you rent a house, when do you pay the rent? At the end or at the beginning of the month? Beginning, isn't it? The house owner expects you to pay at the beginning. That's why he collects two months deposit first. So the university expects you to pay the fees at the beginning of the semester and they give you one month after registration at the beginning of the semester to pay. After that, a late fee kicks in. And that late fee is $200 a week. Right? If you do still not pay. And that can add up to quite a bit if you don't keep not paying. So if you find you cannot pay at the beginning of the semester, you have to go to finance and agree a plan with them. Not with me. I have no authority in financial matters. So if you have agreed a plan with them, then that, that's it. You have agreed, but you must keep to it. Lah. Because many a time the finance manager will tell me, this person agreed but didn't follow. That is why now we are going to be very strict. Bar him. Right? So if they tell me bar, my only recourse is to bar. I have no other choice. You want to lift the bar, you have to go and see finance. To agree to some form of payment. So, generally we are your advocates. We have gone in many instances with various types of proposals or I try to make arrangement for this person to go and see this person, that person, and so on. But the authority is not there. Okay? And now they have got a bank that yesterday they made a first presentation who provides you an education loan. So if you got PTPTN, 150,000, the bank will provide you the rest of the money. Right? So your parents will have to pay the interest for the loan, but you start paying the loan when you start working. So it sort of covers your gaps in financial uh, thing. So try and cooperate. Because the other word that the finance director told me, he said MBBS students owe $12 million. Right? $12 million to the university. He said our percentage of defaulter may be low, but we are the highest in terms of quantum. Right? So when you have a private entity running with $12 million owing to it, you can imagine the cash flow problems here. So if everybody cooperates, all the better. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Dato. So uh, the next question has been directed towards Metsol. Why isn't the Master Metsol not very active uh, among the MBBA students. Why isn't there many volunteering or medical related activities? And that the support from students are very less. And they want a platform where students can interact with lecturers on a more basis. So the question is, why is the mental society not very active among the mental students? And why isn't there many volunteering or medical relation activities? Um, and that the students want a platform where the students and lecturers can interact more. Okay. So um, ever since uh, we've got a new uh, advisor, um, we have been putting activities into place and uh, some of that you, this is one activity, and uh, 
whatever activities were going on before, like the, um, the medical camps, um, blood donations, and uh, those were the activities that were going on. But there are other activities in the pipeline which uh, will be soon. soon coming up. So, um, but what I need for all of you all to do is actually volunteer yourselves for these kind of activities. And if you all don't do that, uh, then where else are you all going to uh, be able to participate in these kind of activities? If, um, and I'm sure um, Dr. Sunita and her group have got activities planned already, which they will inform from time to time. So if we get everybody to actually participate in one activity, that I mean, you, you would actually get uh, your curriculum done, your, your co-curricular activities done one, once or twice in a, in a, in a year. So you, you can fulfill that. Um, they would also probably be, be uh, organizing um, activities where the, the students and the lecturers interact. That's also in the pipeline. So um, we'll just have to wait for them to announce what they have got up their sleeves. But there are quite a lot of things going on. I mean, if students can be more specific and transparent about what sort of activities you really want with interaction of the lecturers, then yes, maybe we look into it. The faculty can also look into it as well. All right. Thank you. So moving on, uh, let me first finish whatever complaints has come into the online platform. One was regarding uh, the organized uh, sports league and interbatch games and all that. For the information of whoever has asked this, Metsoc is organizing a very major sports event which will soon come up and uh, one information that you all have to take into consideration is Metsoc's working year will be from, uh, it's not an academic year, it will be a fiscal year. So it, would, it wouldn't be from June to August, it would be, uh, sorry, from not from September to August, it would be from January to December. So. Whatever happens from January to December will be of one particular Maxwell committee. So there's, the, as I said earlier, there is a very big uh, sports event coming up, which will soon be announced and organized. And one more is uh, with regards to the uh, security guard and the uh, parking issue. I hope everyone knows that the parking issue has been resolved. The Asia Park system has come in. All right. So moving on. Uh, information to the deanery that uh, we actually opened up the floor to students to write down and send in questions to us. So I'll be reading out questions one by one and the deanery can answer to it. So first, uh, there's a student who's brought us a uh, suggestion the link with the integrated system, a lot of material from various departments are being omitted and not uploaded on the LMS. Henceforth, with such a situation, there's time constraints for student. One and second thing is that they say they have they are asking whether the faculty will help uh, help them in preparing for exams like PLAP, USMLE and all that. Okay, I'll start with the LMS. <coughs> um, I think uh, if you look at the history of the LMS, I think uh, it has uh, improved a lot in this academic year. I think uh, those of you who are in year three and year four will uh, be able to attest to that, what it was two years ago and what it is now. So we have improved uh, quite a bit. And I know that off and on there are delays in getting the material up onto the LMS, right? I think that is your issue. Um, what we would like you to do is, if there is a delay, to let us know as soon as possible. And we will contact those coordinators and tell them to put up the material as soon as possible. And we have done that this year in one or two blocks where there has been some delay. Okay. Um, I think to a large extent, as far as I am aware, that matter has been uh, more or less settled. Now, I think the uh, for phase two, the um, usage of LMS is a little bit more patchy. And uh, that is again a work in progress. We have managed to finish with phase one now. And I hope that with the next academic year rolling in, uh, we will be able to get better 
LMS usage in phase two. You know, uh, we have a little bit more constraints when it comes to phase two for various other reasons. Lah. You know, but we will try to address that. But if you have, if you really find that your lectures are not up on LMS, please let us know immediately. And actually, when you, I think the recent block, there was one block where they said the lectures weren't up. And we contacted the coordinator and I think within the 24 hours, everything was put up. So, we will do it. Okay. Sometimes there are lapses because the same lecturers are doing a lot of things. So, sometimes there is a lag. But you need to let us know if there is a lag. Okay. With regards to the uh, USMLE and uh, PLAB and things like that, there is some work that is going on to try to get the USMLE on board so that uh, we offer the USMLE together with the program that you are doing, but uh, it is still in the planning stages. Okay. Um, so, in addition to that, uh, there's one more telling that they want uh, they want to know if the lecture slides can be posted prior to the class. I think to a large extent we do that for LMS lectures lectures are placed on the LMS prior to the lecture sometimes I know there is a delay okay I know recent the recent uh, for example I think in the URI block there was some delay in lectures being put up and it was brought to the to my attention and I spoke to the coordinator and she went around and she got the lectures and she put it up but you see, it's two or three people who are trying to do the thing. And sometimes some lecturers, if they don't provide it, the person cannot put it up on time. It has improved a lot. And I think even when you had that lag, where once the report was made, it was addressed. We will try to make sure that it doesn't happen. But if it does, you need to let us know. right? If you find that something is not on the, this one, on the website, please let us know. Now, the number two thing is, I don't want you to take this in the wrong way, but you can't depend on lecture notes alone um, if you want to get to know the topic well. Okay? Right? You need to read your textbooks. And uh, you need to read your, your text. Depending on PowerPoints alone is not the answer in the long run. That is my own advice to you. Okay? But we will put up the lectures. Now, USMLE, I already told you, there is some work going on to try to get the USMLE on board. But it will take some time. Um, I, I, I really don't know exactly when it will come on board. But there is some work that is going on to try to offer it, at least for you to do the step one and the step two while you are in MASA. Okay. Now, for PLAB, PLAB, you can only sit if you are registered. Okay. So, you need to complete your housemanship to sit for PLAB. You cannot sit for PLAB without housemanship. Because PLAB is an entry exam for you to go and work in the UK. So you won't be able to work in the UK unless you are registered with the medical council in your own country. So PLAB may take some time. Hmm? There is also a move uh, by the university to arrange a training program for the Indian students who are here from India for you to uh, sit for your uh, exit exams right in India. So there is an arrangement being made with a group in India where they will come here, conduct some classes and also provide you online support uh, through the years to facilitate your uh, sitting for the exam. Right? And uh, I was told there is also a guaranteed pass. <laughs> when you say guaranteed pass, uh, I think it means if you fail, they provide you some more material free of charge. No? <laughs> it is not uh, what you said. I don't think you know, anybody can assure you 100% pass. Rate. When that exam itself has a, maybe a, a 10 or 20% pass rate. But these are efforts being made by the university. And similarly, we have an examiner coming from the Thai Medical Council this time for the final professional exam. So he will be evaluating you and also maybe giving us recommendations as, as to what program we can enroll with Thai learning to help our Thai students who are going back to practice there. Okay? And we have got students who are already doing housemanship there in Thailand. Okay? And, uh, and just to uh, go 
going back to the Thai medical council, the, the Thai students, uh, we have, the, the, the faculty has actually organized classes for those who sat for the, who are sitting for the Thai medical council exam. And the first set of classes are over and four students have sat for the exam in April. So the results are apparently uh, round the corner. Lah. We probably should be getting it this week or next week, so we will see. And based on that, we will also try to uh, to, to improve that, you see. Um, and like Dato said, three at least three Thai graduates have already been selected for housemanship in Thailand. So that tells you that the, the faculty is uh, uh, trying to do things to make it as easy as possible for the graduates. Thank you, sir. Uh, and also for... Uh, from the side of MedSOP, with regards to any other exams that you are looking for, the information regulations regarding those exams are actually up on our MedSOP page. So if you actually are following our page, you would know that the materials are available there and those materials are actually from Prof Ganesh and uh, other lecturers as well who have given us. So those materials are on top in their FB page. So moving on, uh, okay, this is a question that is coming from the current uh, year 2 batch, asking about regarding their move to JUC, when will the date be? Is there an exact date? And that uh, the, re, with regards to the hostel in JUC, because they heard rumors saying that the hostel uh, is being equipped with uh, UM students as well, and that the infrastructure uh, doesn't have uh, internet access or anything like before. I was told that there are many. Uh, I was told that there are many hostel rooms that are vacant, yeah. right? So obviously they want to fill up. So if it's being offered to UM students, it is with that intention in mind, but not at the cost of our students. Our students. So our students will always have a place there. Okay? But you must realize that they will try and fill up as much as we can. Mm. So uh, there is even talk of some renovation to make it uh, like a hotel for some guests, right? Or some rooms as well. Okay. Um, Dato, there was a question regarding uh, the date. Is there an exact date where students will be moving? The current year two moving to the phase two sector. I think it's too early also for them to ask such a question. Mean, uh, well, the end of the academic year you go, is it? Yes. And you will get your results, and those who don't succeed will have a supplementary exam. And then those who, the start of the next year, you also know. So I think from there you can work out when is your whole date. True. Because yeah, really. well, I, often I can't recall what is the date. Yeah. I think that it is not a secret. It is the dates are there. Okay. okay. So uh, you will need to learn, uh, you know, apply for hostile accommodation there and you can make those arrangements now itself okay. to make sure you don't run out of rooms or whatever. Okay, uh, the next is with regards to attendance, students asking uh, why why are we marked absent for the whole day even if we missed only two classes in the morning? <laughs> How many percent doctor are you? Are you a 100% doctor or 50% doctor? Mm. That's all. That's the answer. <laughs> right? Medicine is not a course which you study from the textbook. It's a course that you learn from the patients. So if you are going to be absent half the day, how can you expect me to mark you present for the full day? You may have missed the most important part of the day. Right? So that's a simple answer. I think you have to accept it. We are not compromising on that. Right? But but I always tell you this proviso. You must tell us ahead of time when you are going to be absent. And there is always the possibility we may give you permission. And if we give you permission, then you will not be marked absent. There's a valid reason for you to be away. But the problem is, Almost 100% of the absentees don't talk about it. They just remain away. They don't get permission from anyone. 
and that's very bad behavior. Okay. Thank you. The next uh, question is, why isn't there any appreciation ceremony or event for students who excel in his or her end block or end of postings? <laughs> <laughs> so they're asking if this, they can be done anything to appreciate or celebrate the extra hard work. <laughs> Maybe a certificate as uh, from the board of examination or something. And uh, get a third thing, you can go with that first and go with the next question later. I think uh, for those who finish the year two professional exam and uh, you, if you get the distinction, you are, you are placed on the Dean's list and you are given a certificate at the beginning of year 3. Okay. If I don't think that is a major issue, if you really want to be appreciated for your efforts over the year, maybe not after every block club, but we can look at your aggregate uh, results at the end of the year and say that if you have got a string of A's and your CGPA is consistently above 3.5 in year 1, I don't see any reason why we can't uh, give you a certificate. I, I think we can work on that. That I think we can. I don't think there's a major issue. Uh, but whoever wants to do that, come to us and then we need to sit down and we need to frame it out and then I need to, to take it to faculty and tell them that, that we are planning this also. Uh, just to make sure that everything is clean and clear. Hmm? I don't see any reason why we can't do that. Yeah, I think it's very possible. We can always have a ceremony in the class itself, <laughs> right? Uh, so that it avoids any additional expenses and so on. And there is an appreciation ceremony in the class. But I think whether to the extent of giving a certificate to everyone who got an A or A+, plus, uh, whether you really want that, because sometimes there will be objections from the others, right? So this is one opinion. I need to know from Metsop what is it exactly you want. If you come up with an accepted proposal from all students, you definitely consider. Okay, the next question is with regards to the forthcoming election, whether there will be a one day holiday on Thursday. And if Pakatan wins, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> I think. <coughs> You have a holiday for election. No doubts about it. You are encouraged to go and vote wherever you are registered. And those who are not registered, I would encourage you, don't miss out the next time. Right? In, in answer to the next question, the answer has already been given. If Pakatan Harapan wins, the next two days are a public holiday. Um, but then the question is regarding the exam that uh, there are certain uh, year two is having exam on Friday. So what happens to the exam on Friday then? Well, if it, the public holiday is declared, then we will have to think about it. Like, I know, well, let me tell you one thing. I know there is a special lecture in the university on Friday. Right? And the instruction is whether it's holiday or not, the special lecture will go on. Right? This is a special lecture at the highest level for the academic stuff. Right? So that is all. Uh, well, what do you think? I think if it's a holiday on the level, then it is a holiday. I think we will conduct an exam. That's right. We, have, make the the we, we have to follow the government of the day, like, yeah. whatever it is, right? Uh, so, but we, do, we cannot presume anything, right? So, let's just go and take part in the elections for those who can and just await the outcome peacefully and conduct ourselves honorably and professionally, right? So, I think if there is a public holiday, you don't have to come back for the exam. But if there is no public holiday, you better, better <laughs> very well better come. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, the next question is, uh, okay, <laughs> quite funny. If there's a particular posting or something and we need to travel to any other place, can we be provided with petrol or toll <laughs> claims? <laughs> Let me start small. For what uh, teaching activity? Yes. 
some students they say they travel to many uh, Kerala towns or sometimes to Tanjung Karang as well and all that. So if if related to academic issues and we have to travel, can we be provided with petrol or toll claims? No. It's a clear cut answer. Yeah, it's clear, but even for the academic staff, it's very clear. Yeah. Alright, so moving on, uh, they're asking, uh, can MASA students enter the other wards if they're attached to a different department in HSB or HKL? You are not encouraged to do that. I mean, we have had this request previously. And some students, very enthusiastic students, have gone in at odd times and run into problem because they are disturbing the peace of that ward. Right? And they don't know who you are. So I think we are not encouraged. So moving on. Uh, they are suggest, talking about the cafe food being unhygienic. I don't know how specific is that. And uh, can there be any arrangement of tutorial sessions, especially for international students? With regards to unhygienic cafe food, I know the canteen is subjected to health regulations and health inspections under food quality safety control. Right? So if you do see any unhygienic practices that you have observed, I think you have every right to point it out to us so that we can bring it up to the management. Right? Uh, but all food handlers and so on have to be vaccinated and have to be certified according to health standards. With regards to special classes for international students, I think that is being done in some way because we have got the Thai students, the Indian students and so on, we have got trying to have special classes for them. But if you find that any group needs special classes, my advice is to approach the particular head of department or the lecturer with your request, and then uh, we can, they can bring it up to us to consider. We will encourage if it can be arranged. We will encourage special classes if it can be arranged, and if the request is a reasonable one. Okay. Then having said that, uh, we also know that you know, the OAP classes that we are arranging for phase one, apparently from what I hear, the attendance is around 25%. So those classes are actually directed at students who need uh, assistance. But students don't attend those classes. <coughs> so that's also an issue that sometimes it, it's a two-way street. You, know. you also have to tell us what you want to do. When you don't come for the classes, lecturers say they have actually prepared questions and they are discussing MEQs, and, but there's nobody around. Thank you, sir. Moving on, uh, there's two uh, complaints, but uh, similar ones. With regards to different lecturers having different teaching styles and that uh, also the tutorial sessions don't happen sometimes in the way they are supposed to be. Students are not encouraged to ask doubts or something. They just come, the questions are posted and they answer and they leave. regards to academic quality and the type of teaching, your access to that or remedy to that will to give feedback to the deanery, right? With particular examples and particular staff names, right? Uh, you know my number, you know email address and so on. Uh, you can be, but you provide feedback. Then we will address it with the lecturer council. I, I think it's valid complaints. I'm not saying that 100% of the lecturers are perfect. But we will take that into consideration in remedial efforts. Right? We, we will sort of uh, maybe advise them. And if the advice is again not followed, then you will not see them around after two years. Right? So that's, that's what will happen. Thank you, Dato. Um, so, one question here is asking, student is demanding on statistics, asking how many MBBS graduates do we have every year and how many of them are getting a job? 
and uh, also why is there increase in international students? How many MBBS graduates do we have? We have 550 graduates so far in four batches. How many of them have got a job? I think all of them have got a job, except international students, like Malaysian students, right? Because housemanship in Malaysia is only open to Malaysian citizens. Others will have to go back to their own countries or sit exit qualifications from their own countries, all right? Now, we have done a very, uh, I mean, the results are preliminary. Uh, the performance of the graduates in the second batch, that they have completed two years of housemanship, is about the national average, right? So you are getting about one quarter of them getting extended in at least one posting, right? One quarter, right? Six of them got extended in two postings. Right? So, it is in your interest that you do well academically when you are doing the MBBS program. You must go to the wards more regularly. Otherwise, you will be in that category. Right? So, and the comments generally are favorable. Right? Uh, I think most of them mention, those who have spoken to me, that they are committed and they, the only thing that they say is they don't open their mouths very much. <laughs> Here you ask a lot of questions, <laughs> but there I think you keep quiet. <laughs> so you must learn to communicate. One suggestion that is coming is regarding uh, ECE practical sessions, that they are not enough and they want more to reduce the number of lectures and increase the practical sessions. We take that note on that one. In our curriculum review, we we'll include it. And generally, we are looking at revamping the EC, and you will agree that EC has now been very much revamped. Okay. So the last uh, suggestion for the day that has come in uh, is with regards asking for a place to study after classes. This is uh, for the hostel students. They're asking at least during late night till about 1 or 2 a.m. They want a place to study. I have raised this many times uh, with uh, the person in charge of hostels. They have given some certain areas which are common areas uh, because late at night they are also very cautious for opening up such areas. Eh? So uh, we will take it up. I cannot give you the answer now. Uh, but you know, one, two o'clock, three o'clock, again, you know, there are questions of security. Uh, you must learn to study in your rooms. Eh? Right, thank you, Dato. So, so far we've answered every question that's come in. Now, moving on to the next segment, opening up the floor. Anybody? suggestion and I want to hear your opinion about it um, <coughs> our batch is of 200 students and for the regular lectures all the 200 students are shoved in the same lecture hall and uh, often at times people sitting at the back they do not get the same uh, kind of involvement during the lecture by the lecturer and I just feel that that is wrong, considering I also sit at the back. So unless I actually approach the lecturer, the attention does not come. So is it possible to maybe divide the batch even during the lecture times, the regular lecture? If you could have like 100, 100 students each, that would already be a great progress. Is that possible? It means uh, doing the lecture twice. Or maybe we could have a simultaneous lecture taken by two lecturers. Two venues. Yeah. It's going to be very uh, difficult to to operationalize in view of the facility constraints, All right? But at the same time, maybe as a general answer to this issue, yes, we want to get away from lectures as much as we can into more active forms of learning, All right? So we are in the curriculum review looking at how the delivery of such 
material can be provided, right? And one, uh, you know, the visual reality uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, giving uh, audiovisual aids, uh, also uh, some other involvement like flipped classrooms and so on, where the students have to be more actively participating. I can gather your point. I agree with your point. But you will have to give us a little bit of time to operationalize it. And we will look at it, definitely. And uh, in our uh, sort of motivation to the lectures,